good morning. It's good to see you. If you've got your Bibles, you want to open to the book of Job. I wish I had a funny, cute, or interesting story to start with this morning, but I simply don't. We have a lot to get to today, and um, so I foregoed a, a couple of uh, illustrations that I wanted to use early on here so we can get to the Word of God. But uh, I think since you guys are the ones who are here on a holiday weekend, uh, at the early service, nonetheless, um, I think you guys would agree with me in saying that God's Word is all sufficient. Amen? So we don't need a story or a joke. We just can go straight to God's Word and be blessed. And that is what we are going to do today. So far in our series here in the book of Job, we have discovered two important things. Number one... We talked about the fact that we need to have everything right before everything goes wrong. Because today, by the way, is where we're going to get to the part where everything begins to unravel for Job. Everything starts going wrong. But in week number one, we looked at the fact that Job had everything right in his life before it went wrong. And then last week, we talked about what it means to be faithful to our families, no matter what. We looked at how Job, as a dad, was faithful to his children, even when they were not following in his faith, even when they were making other life choices, things that he wouldn't have chosen for himself or even for them. Job continued to remain faithful to them. Today we're going to pick up in verse 13, and this is the section of Scripture where we are going to see this faithful man, a man who has been faithful to God, a man who has everything right in his life, a man who's faithful to his family. He's going to lose basically everything he has in one single day. Here's what the text says, starting in verse 13. One day, when Job's sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and reported, While the oxen were plowing and the donkeys grazing nearby, the Sabaeans swooped down and took them away. They struck down the servants with the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. He was still speaking when another messenger came and reported, God's fire fell from heaven. It burned the sheep and the servants and devoured them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. That messenger was still speaking when yet another came and reported the Chaldeans formed three bands, made a raid on the camels and took them away. They struck down the servants with the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. He was still speaking when yet another messenger came and reported your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in the oldest brother's house, And suddenly a powerful wind swept in from the desert and struck the four corners of the house. It collapsed on the young people so that they died. And I alone have escaped to tell you. Then Job stood up, tore his robe, and shaved his head. He fell to the ground and worshipped, saying, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will leave this life. The Lord gives, and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And then verse 22 says, Throughout all of this, Job did not sin or blame God for anything. Each time I read this part of Job's story, I do what I think most of you probably do. I think to myself how I would have handled that. I try to put myself there in Job's sandals or shoes and and I assume like most of you in in my honesty with the Lord in that moment I'm forced to admit that I probably would not have handled this nearly as well as Job did and we can see from this text that Job is broken we we can see that he is wounded we can see that his heart is aching in this moment of chaos in this moment of loss he's basically in in the course of a very short amount of time He's lost everything of value in his life. And just like you and I, Job had options in that moment. He had options on this day. He had options in the midst of that situation. And we can see from his response 
how unwavering his faith in God was. But he didn't have to respond that way. He could have made a choice to respond in a much different way. Today I'm going to challenge you, I'm going to encourage you to make your choice. Because I think Job had made these choices in his life long before he was presented with these choices on this day. And I think it's important for you and I, as people who want to be unwaveringly faithful to God, to make our choice. And so today, at the end of each point, I'm going to encourage you to make a choice. I'm going to, I'm going to ask you just to write there in your bulletin what your choice is. That's between you and the Lord But I want to encourage you to really process it and think about it and go back and even consider it more this week. In fact, that is our big idea for today. It's simply just make your choice. I believe there is a time coming when we will experience things, not maybe like Job experienced, but we are going to experience things here in the American church that has never been experienced in the history of our culture before. And Christians are going to be called upon to make a choice. We are going to have to choose, when things get tough, how we respond in those situations. And and I truly do pray and I truly do hope that none of you and none of us ever have a day like Job had. But the reality is this, if you live long enough and if you follow the Lord long enough, you're going to have days when disaster strikes. You're going to have days of devastation and days of disappointment. You're going to have days that are filled with discouragement from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to sleep. You're going to be confronted with death somewhere along the way. You're going to be confronted with defeat and doubt and despair. There are going to be days in your life that you just feel totally desperate because they are so difficult. And that's where Job is in this moment in his life. And when that happens, you're going to have to make some of the same choices and have some of the same options that Job had on this day. You're going to have to make a choice. And I want to be sure you're ready to respond. So the first one I want to look at is this. First, you can choose to panic or you can choose to pray. You can choose to panic or you can choose to pray. Now, we all know that we should pray and we all know that we should not panic. But let's be honest, church. Our flesh is quick to panic and slow to pray. Amen? Like, when, when, when it's all falling apart, when the chaos starts, when, when the madness of the moment overwhelms us, even though we know to pray, we're, we're still quick to panic. Because it's hard to pray. It's hard to pray when you're confused. It's hard to pray when you're caught off guard. It's hard to pray when you're confronted with devastation and tragedy and difficulties. It's hard to pray when you feel cornered and feel like there's no safe place to run. I mean, think about Job. I mean, moment after moment, this servant hasn't even finished talking, and another shows up with more bad news. That one doesn't finish talking, and another shows up with more bad news. That one doesn't even finish talking, and another shows up with more bad news, and this just continues. It's easy to panic in moments like that. And it's much harder to live in a place of courage and unwavering faith and find the ability to pray in moments like these. In times when everything is falling apart, we don't even sometimes know what to pray for. I want to ask you a question, and this isn't to point anybody out. I don't think this will will um, embarrass you in any way, shape, or form, but, but can I just ask you to raise your hand if you've ever been in a situation or had a time in your life when it was so hard to pray because you didn't even really know how to pray or what to pray for. Anybody been there? Anybody can raise their hand with that? Yeah, and I don't ask you to raise your hand to point you out. I ask you to raise your hand because I want you to know you're not alone. We've all been there. We've all faced that kind of day or that kind of devastation or that kind of situation where where we didn't even know what to pray for or how to pray. Can I just tell you that that's not uncommon? I'm sure Job felt like that in his day of distress. 
I know that Paul knew what that feeling was like because he wrote this to the Romans in Romans chapter 8. He says this in verse 26. He says, in the same way, the Spirit also helps us in our weakness, our weaknesses, because we do not know what to pray for as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with inexpressible groanings. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Paul, Paul did not write these words out of some kind of theoretical theology. He, he's not just making this up. This comes from a place of real life experience with pain and suffering in his own life. In fact, this section of scripture starts a little bit earlier, like in verse 18, with Paul saying this, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that's going to be revealed to us. Paul's talking about suffering here. The Greek word that Paul actually uses here to describe sufferings is the same Greek word that is used to describe the sufferings of Christ. These were difficult days, devastating days. Days filled with suffering and sorrow for Paul. These these are days that Paul felt like were tough on him. They were detrimental to his faith, and yet he's finding a way to stand unwaveringly, not even knowing how to pray or what to pray for. But, But here's what I want you to notice. He's still praying and depending on God for that prayer. He's not panicking. He could have panicked, but instead he's praying even when he didn't know what to pray for. Peter offers us a word of encouragement in 1 Peter 5, 9 through 11. He says, resist him, firm in the faith, be unwavering, knowing that the same kind of sufferings are being experienced by your fellow believers throughout the world. The God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, establish, strengthen, and support you after you have suffered a little while. To him be dominion forever. Amen. Our our faith in Christ, church, does not exempt us from hardship. It does not exempt us from heartache. It does not exempt us from any other kind of suffering. Jesus himself said these words in John 16, 33. He says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. And then he says this, you will have suffering in this world. Be courageous. Be unwavering, he says. I have conquered the world. See, having the Lord in your life does not mean every day is going to be easy. It doesn't mean you're not going to face, at some point in your life, something that seems absolutely impossible to you, like Job did. It it doesn't mean you're never going to have a burden to bear. And when that time comes, you're going to have a choice to make. Either you can panic or you can pray. The Colossian church certainly had many reasons to worry. They had many reasons to panic. Their panic would have been justified by many. And yet, what does Paul encourage them to do? He encourages them to pray. In places like Colossians 4, 2 through 4, devote yourselves to prayer. He doesn't say devote yourself to panic. Devote yourself to prayer. He says, stay alert in it with thanksgiving. And at the same time, pray also for us. That God may open a door for us, for the word, to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Again, to the Romans, Paul wrote in Romans 12, 12, Rejoice in hope, be patient in affliction, be persistent in prayer. To the Philippians, Paul said, don't worry about anything, don't panic. But in everything through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Church, you're going to have to make a choice in moments like these. And the choice is, do I panic or do I pray? I want to encourage you to make your choice. There's a blank there for you. It says, I will, and blank. You fill it in. Will you panic or will you pray? Will you panic or will you pray? you got to make your choice. 
The second choice we see here in Job's life, and a choice that I think we need to be prepared to make ourselves, is this. It's the choice between despair and dependence. We can, we can despair the moment, and despair the news, or we can depend on God. Many times during great hardship, it's easy to fall into the rut of despair. But a much better choice, of course, is to depend on God. There are going to be times in your life where you're going to be desperate. There are going to be times in your life where you feel like everything's going wrong. Times in your life where nothing seems to be working out. But you can't get stuck in that moment and fall into that pit or that rut of desperation. I I want to show you three examples from the Bible where we see this happen. And I want you to notice that in all three of these instances, there is a choice. A choice to get stuck in despair or a choice to depend on God. The first comes from the life of King David, a man after God's own heart. I'm going to read to you from Psalms 22. There's many psalms that can be picked from from here because this is where David is pouring his heart out to God as he does in many of the psalms. And and, um, many of the psalms kind of reflect the struggle that David's having in his own life for various reasons at various times. But I want you to hear this one in Psalm 22, starting in verse 1. He says, My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Why are you so far from my deliverance and from my words of groaning? My God, I cry by day, but you do not answer by night, yet I have no rest. But you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. Our ancestors trusted in you. They trusted and you rescued them. They cried to you and were set free. They trusted in you and were not disgraced. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by people. Everyone who sees me mocks me. They sneer and shake their heads. He relies on the Lord. Let him save him. Let the Lord rescue him since he takes pleasure in him. It was you who brought me out of the womb making me secure at my mother's breast. I was given over to you at birth. You have been my God from my mother's womb. Don't be far from me, because distress is near, and there is no one to help. You can hear the battle inside of the life of David. The battle to stay not in the middle of despair, but in the middle of dependence on God, and he's having to fight that battle. Now, David was a king. David is anointed by God, but I want you to see, still, not everything is easy in David's life. Not everything is perfect. Not everything is going right. He's having to make a choice. Next, I want you to consider the words and the example of the Apostle Paul. And again, there are multiple examples we could pull from or pick from, but I want you to see this one in 2 Corinthians 1, 8 through 10. Paul says, now we don't want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, of our affliction. Not everything's going right in his life either. Our affliction that took place in Asia, we were completely overwhelmed beyond our strength so that we even despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death so that we would not trust in ourselves but in God who raises the dead. He has delivered us from such terrible death, and He will deliver us. We have put our hope in Him that He will deliver us again. Again, we see a giant of the faith, the Apostle Paul, a true man of God, admitting that he is totally overwhelmed. He he says here he despaired. He got to the point of desperation that was so strong he despaired even of life. He thought surely they were going to die. And he had to make a choice to get stuck in that despair or to depend on God. And we can see from the text, he made the right choice. He chose to trust in God, to depend on God. He put his hope in God, but he had to make that choice. This last example might surprise you, but I think it's an important one to to recognize, to realize, and to consider. It's the example of Jesus himself. Do you remember what Jesus says in Matthew 26? Verses 38 through 39, it says, He said to them, I am deeply grieved to the point of death. 
Remain here and stay awake with me. And going a little further, he fell face down and he prayed, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. Here as Jesus faces the reality of his crucifixion, as he faces the gravity of carrying the sins of the entire world, he is literally sweating drops of blood in the garden. He is grieved to the point of death, the text says. But he doesn't get stuck in that rut that would be so easy to get stuck in. Instead, he chooses to depend on God. We hear it so clearly in those words, yet not as I will, but as you will. And we could look at so many more. Certainly we see it in the life of Job. We see it in the life of Jonah as he struggles with this choice. We see it in the life of Moses. We see it in the life of Mary as she has to make this choice in her struggle. Am I going to despair about this or am I going to depend on God for this? We see it in the life of Abraham. We see it in the life of Esther. We see it in the life of Ruth. I mean, we, honestly, we could virtually talk about anybody of any significance in the Bible and see that at some point they had to make this choice. And at some point, you're going to have to make this choice too. What are you going to do? What choice are you going to make? Are you going to stay stuck in the rut of despair, or are you going to depend on God? The third choice is this. The choice to wonder about it, or the choice to worship through it. Are you going to wonder, or are you going to worship? This always amazes me about Job. After learning about all that he lost, it says in verse 20 that Job stands up, tears his robe, shaves his head. I know a little bit about that. And then he falls to the ground and worships. He he doesn't cry out, God, why me? He doesn't wonder what went wrong or what he did wrong. He just worships God. And you know what? As we watch Job do this, as we watch him worship, I think we learn some very important things about worship that most of us don't know, or if we have known them, we have long ago forgotten them when it comes to worship. We've made worship this moment or this period of time in our church services where we're singing hymns and praises to God, which is a big part of what worship is, but that's not all of what worship is. But, but we've, made, we've made worship this thing that Job shows us maybe isn't exactly what we think it is. Let, let me tell you what I mean. I think there's three things here we learned from Job that would maybe counter some of what we believe about worship. And the first one is this. Worship comes from the heart, not our happiness. Job is not happy. He has just lost everything. And yet he's worshiping God because worship doesn't come out of an expression of our happiness. Worship is an expression of our heart for our love for the Lord. You see, we tend to think of worship as being this time filled with joy and happiness and we're singing these beautiful lyrics that have been crafted and designed and gone over and scratched through and words have been changed. And, 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 and particularly with modern day worship, it's all about making us feel something good inside of us. They're, they're actually worship songs about feeling good. And, and I, want you to, I want to be clear here, like worship can be experienced in the midst of happiness worship should make us happy on some level because we're worshiping god it's it's not that being happy in worship is a bad thing it's just it's not the only thing job reminds us that worship is really about our heart for god not our happiness in this world job was broken in this moment he was anything but happy But his heart was still ready to worship. I've heard many people say things like this. And and at times in my own life, 
I've even experienced this. It's hard to worship when you're not happy. I've heard many people say, well, you know what, I, I just, I can't go to church because I'm going through a hard time. Well, that's probably when you need to be in church. I've heard people say after the loss of a spouse or a child, like, I just, I can't go back to, to church anymore because when I do, I, it makes me sad because I remember him or her. They use it as an excuse not to worship. They use their lack of being happy or their moments of grief as an excuse not to to be a part of worship. And again, church isn't the only place you can worship, but that's really what they're talking about in that. There, there are many who are not here this very day to worship the Lord because they just didn't feel like it today. Let's be honest, some of y'all out there online just didn't feel like it today. Maybe even some of us that are here didn't fully participate in worship this morning. We didn't fully engage with our Lord and Savior because something went wrong this week or this weekend or this morning on the way to church and we're just not real happy about it. I think we should all see Job's example and remember this. We 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 need to remember what worship's about and it's not about our happiness, it's about our heart. The second thing I would tell you about worship is this. Worship is about God's goodness, not our gain. So much about today's worship is about what we get out of it and what we're going to gain. Worship is about the goodness and the glory of God. It's not about us. And, and I know most of us really do worship the Lord from a sincere place. I'm not trying to say you're not sincere in your worship. I'm not trying to say you're even selfish in your worship or you're trying to make it about you. I'm just saying that like, unintentionally many times if if we're not careful that's what it becomes about because there there's a small part of us that wants to make it about us there's a frequently an aspect of our thinking or our motivation in worship that says i need to worship the lord so he'll bless me i'm going to go and i'm going to honor god so he'll honor me I'm going to go and worship him because I know all good things come from him and I want to make sure that I'm on his good side. And church, can I just tell you, when that becomes our motivation, we're not, we're not worshiping God for the right reasons anymore. Job, Job worshiped because he really believed in his heart that God was good. Even in the middle of the chaos and the complete wreckage that was surrounding him in his life, He doesn't come to God out of this place of wanting to gain anything. He just comes to God out of this deep desire to express that he still realizes God is good and God is glorious and he knows that God's grace is still in his life. Finally, number three here, I think we need to realize that worship is about yielding ourselves to the Lord, not just about yearning for God. Let me explain that a little bit. Worship, worship is about yearning for God. We should yearn for God in our lives. We should, we should want to, to be close to the Lord. We should put our hands in the air. We should sing and we should worship in spirit and truth from a place of yearning to be close to God and to wanting to honor God. I'm not saying we shouldn't do that. That's all good and well, but our worship can't just be about that, because that makes it about us, and it makes it about a feeling, and it makes, us, makes it about us just being close to God, because we want to feel good knowing that we're there. You know what worship really is? Worship is us yielding and submitting our lives to God, saying we're putting everything else in our life on hold. We're going to go worship you for this hour. And, and there's definitely a sense here in Job's life, in this text, of Job yearning for God in the middle of the mess. But what we see even more is a man who's willing to yield everything in his life in the middle of the mess and just humble himself and sit in the submission of God. It's a great reminder for us. But once again, there's going to come a time when you're going to have to make a choice 
Are you going to wonder, why me, or why now, or why this, or why that, or are you going to worship? You're going to have to make your choice. Number four, the choice between sulking or seeking. In moments like this, you can choose to sulk or you can choose to seek. Job had to make a choice. He could have sat around all day sulking about everything that had just happened. He could have felt sorry for himself. Certainly, we feel sorry for him. He could have moped around. He could have pouted about it. Or he could make a different choice and start seeking God in the middle of the mess. And that's the choice he made. It's a harder choice. It's a much more difficult choice. It's a more difficult choice than you might think if you've never been in a situation that just felt completely desperate. Because it's easy to sulk and it's hard to seek. The Bible says a lot about seeking the right things. For the sake of time, we're just going to look at two passages of Scripture on this. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 6, verses 33 and 34. He said, but seek first, seek, not sulk, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be provided for you. Therefore, don't worry about for tomorrow, because tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Here Jesus is talking to people who are worried they're, they're worried about things you're probably not worried about. They're worried about having enough food to survive. They're worried about having enough clothing to survive. These are people who could definitely be sulking in their situations in life. But Jesus doesn't encourage them to sulk in their situation. Instead, he says, seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. He said, seek that first. In the very next chapter, in chapter 7, Jesus says this. Chapter 7, verse 7. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. And the one who knocks, the door will be opened. He, he does not say the one who sulks will find. When you sulk, you don't find what you're looking for, do you? <laughs> He doesn't say the one who sulks will be successful. He says the one who seeks the right things will be blessed. The one who seeks the right things will find. The one who seeks is the one who's going to be successful. Job had every reason, every possible reason in the world to feel sorry for himself and to sit around and sulk about it. But instead he made a much different choice. He decided in the middle of that mess to seek God instead. Again, the question is, what will you do? You're going to have to make a choice. You might as well make it today. When the moment comes, are you going to sulk or are you going to seek? And I want to close with this last one. You can blame or you can bless Two choices, two very different choices, two very different options. Again, one is easy, one is hard. The easy choice is to blame God. The harder is to bless the Lord. You can blame God in the middle of the mess, or you can bless God in the middle of the mess. Job made his choice. It says in verse 22, throughout all, throughout all of this, Job did not sin or blame God for anything. He didn't blame God. Instead, he blessed God with his worship. He blessed God by remaining unwaveringly faithful in the face of this incredible hardship. He blessed the Lord with his surrender and by yielding his life to the Lord and making the right choices in these moments of what had to be complete madness and chaos in his life. You can blame God or you can bless him. You're going to have to make a choice. What will you choose? There's a place there for you to make your choice. I'm going to close today by reading a, another psalm. It's Psalms 103. I'm going to read the first 12 verses of this. And I want you to listen to this. 
You might even want to just close your eyes and let it just kind of wash over you and just come, come into you. You might want to look at the screen. You might want to turn there in your Bible to Psalm 103 as we read this. Whatever is most comfortable for you, however you think you're going to receive it the best. I want to close with this, and, and I just want you to hear it. He says, My soul, bless the Lord and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. My soul, bless the Lord and do not forget all His benefits. He forgives all your iniquity. He heals all your diseases. He redeems your life from the pit. He crowns you with faithful love and compassion. He satisfies you with good things. Your youth is renewed like the eagle. The Lord executes acts of righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. He revealed his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in faithful love. He will not always accuse us or be angry forever. He has not dealt with us as our sins deserve or repaid us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his faithful love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. We all have things we wonder about. We all have things that we can be tempted to blame God for. But you know what? We all have many reasons to bless the Lord today as well. The main one is, is that He is willing to forgive us of our sins, as the psalmist wrote. The Lord is compassionate and gracious. And praise God, He has not dealt with us as our sins deserve. Instead, he sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ, to die on a cross for our sins so that we could be forgiven, changed, transformed, and adopted into his family. Praise God that Jesus went to that cross and shed his blood and sacrificed his life so that we could live. Your life is not going to be perfect, neither is mine. Certainly Job's wasn't. But praise God, we have a perfect Savior who has a perfect love for us. If you have never called on Him, repented of your sins, confessed and believed, we would ask you, implore you, beg you to do that this day because that is the only way to be saved. The Bible says there is no other name under heaven by which man can be saved. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. No one. Not even you. If you have not given your life to the Lord, do it today. And when the day comes and you have to make a choice, I pray you make the right ones, but the most important choice you will ever make in your life is what you do with Jesus the Christ, the Messiah. You need to make your choice. Let's pray. If you have not called on the name of the Lord, we ask or would pray that you would make that choice today to believe in Jesus. We're not going to ask you to come to the front. I'm not going to even ask you to raise a hand. This isn't a numbers thing. It's not an ego thing. It's a between you and God thing, and it's an important choice thing. If you haven't believed, if you haven't confessed, if you haven't repented, do so now. Just say, Lord, it's me. I confess that I'm a sinner. I know that I've messed things up in my life. I know that I've gone astray and fallen short. So I pray now by faith that you would save me. I repent of my sins and ask in faith that you would change me from the inside out. That you would wash my sins away and cast them as far as the east is from the west.
I thank you for your grace and for your goodness. Father, as we close this time of worship, we thank you for being a God who forgives us even when we make the wrong choice. Even when we wonder instead of worship and we sulk instead of seek. Father, even when we do the things that make perfect sense to us in the moment, we look back and we regret later on. Lord, we're thankful that you're still there, guiding loving, providing for us. Father, I pray we would make the right choices moving forward. I pray that somehow we could be unwavering in our faith, just as Job was to you. We thank you for teaching us more from this man's life and his story, and we look forward to that which is to come in the weeks ahead. Lord, we love you, we thank you, and we pray these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thanks for joining us here on YouTube or social media uh, for this message. We pray that God uses it to bless your life. If you don't mind, hit the subscribe, the follow, the like, the thumbs up button. Uh, Leave an encouraging comment down below. It's so encouraging for us to hear how this is impacting you wherever you may be. And if you have a prayer request, we'd love to pray for you with that as well. You can submit those by going to our website, cowboyfellowship.org. We pray that this blesses you. Thanks for being a part of our online family.